So we're walking into the resuscitation bay. We got a heads up from the EMS that this gentleman was uh, in bad shape. So we went ahead and we prepared our innovation table. Uh, we got all of our equipment out and ready to go. Basic pharmacology involved in intubation. When we intubate individuals, we often talk about two classes of drugs, the sedatives and our paralytics. We often don't perform intubation using just one or the other. We don't like to paralyze patients and have them cognit cognitively intact while we're throwing a tube down their throat. So oftentimes we first do our sedatives, push our sedatives, allow the patient to feel a little bit more comfortable, and then we paralyze them, relax their airway, and get that tube down. Okay? The first sedative drug we're going to talk about is Atomidate. Atomidate is an ultra-short-acting sedative, which makes it favorable in the ED environment. Atomidate is dosed at 0.3 mg per kilogram IV push, has an onset of 30 to 45 seconds, and has a duration of 10 minutes. Atomidate is useful as it has minimal effects on blood pressure, so it is good to use in hypotensive patients. Another aspect of Atomidate is that it can cause adrenal suppression, which is oftentimes not clinically significant, but you may be pimped on this question. The next sedative we will discuss is ketamine. Ketamine is a dissociative agent and a PCP derivative that provides both analgesic and sedative properties. Ketamine is dosed at 1 to 2 mg per kilogram IV, has an onset of 30 to 45 seconds, and a duration of 30 minutes. Ketamine is useful as it provides both bronchodilatory effects and allows patients to maintain their airway reflexes. For these reasons, ketamine is often the agent of choice for asthmatic patients that show up to the emergency department in respiratory distress requiring intubation. Another property of ketamine is that it causes a catecholamine surge, which provides a transient increase in blood pressure. Ketamine is thus a useful agent for hypotensive patients. The last sedative we will discuss in this lecture is propofol. Propofol is an ultra-short-acting hypnotic with no analgesic properties. It has a very rapid onset and a very short duration of action. Propofol is dosed at 1 mg per kilogram IV push. It has an onset of 20 to 30 seconds and has a duration of 3 to 4 minutes. One property of propofol that you should note is that it causes hypotension. One way I like to remember this is propofol hypotension. So make sure you're careful in using propofol in a patient that is either already hypotensive or has the potential to become hypotensive. In these patients, agents like atomidate or ketamine have higher utility. When considering an agent for sedation prior to intubation, you want to think of the three most commonly used sedative drugs, atomidate, ketamine, and propofol. Each drug's dose, onset of action, duration of action, and side effect profile should always be considered and communicated with the clinical team before drug administration. Our next class of drugs are the paralytics. Once a state of amnesia and sometimes analgesia are obtained with sedative medications, paralytics are then rapidly administered. Our first paralytic is succinylcholine, or SUX. SUX is a depolarizing paralytic that binds to the motor end plate, causing depolarization, then relaxation. Clinically, this can manifest as brief fasciculations all over the body before the patient goes limp. So don't panic if you see this. It is a normal consequence of how the drug works. Succinylcholine is dosed at 1.5 to 2 mg per kilogram IV. It has an onset of about 60 seconds, and it is important to wait the full 60 seconds before you attempt intubation, as your patient may not be adequately paralyzed. Succinylcholine has a duration of 4 to 5 minutes, and has a side effect profile that causes a transient rise in potassium. This is important as patients on dialysis or patients with crush or burn injuries may be susceptible to increases in serum potassium. One other side effect of succinylcholine is it can cause malignant hyperthermia, so be sure to ask your patient if they have had a prior history of malignant hyperthermia. The second paralytic we will discuss is rocuronium or ROC. ROC is a non-depolarizing agent that does not bind to the motor end plate of the neuromuscular junction like succinylcholine does, so you do not see the contractions or fasciculations that are often seen with sucks. Instead, 
rocuronium acts as a competitive inhibitor that competes for motor endplate sites with acetylcholine. Rocuronium is dosed at 1.2 to 1.5 mg per kilogram and is administered IV. Rocuronium has an onset of action of about 60 seconds similar to succinylcholine. However, it has a duration of action that is 30 to 45 minutes. This long duration of action means there's prolonged paralysis when you use rocuronium, especially in patients with liver failure. This means there can be a loss of neurological exam that are important sometimes for neurology or neurosurgery consults. In addition, sedation must be titrated so you don't have prolonged paralysis with inadequate sedation. There is currently a reversal agent called Sugamidex, but we'll save that for another lecture. In summary, endotracheal intubation involves two classes of drugs, sedatives and paralytics. There are three major sedatives that are commonly used in the emergency department, etomidate, ketamine, and propofol. And there are two main paralytics, succinylcholine and rocuronium. The intricacies and details involved in this pharmacology are critical to your ability to successfully and safely intubate a patient. Before we delve into the procedure of intubation, let's take a brief look at the functional anatomy of the upper airway. A clear understanding of the anatomy is probably the most important step in becoming proficient in intubation and will guide your decision making for intubation and allow you to troubleshoot complications. The first anatomical structure you will encounter is the teeth. Pay attention to patients with buck teeth, damaged teeth, or dentures as this can complicate your airway. From there, you will need to locate the tongue. Most importantly, know where the vallecula is located as this will be the point of manipulation when using your curved Macintosh blade. Being able to properly manipulate the vallecula with the Mac blade will allow you to mobilize the epiglottis and visualize the vocal cord. Remember, the vocal cords and trachea are always anterior to the esophagus. Take a look at this Macintosh blade being inserted improperly and not in the vallecula. The epiglottis does not move. However, when placed in the vallecula, the epiglottis moves out of the way. As you can see in this picture, the tongue and vallecula lay anterior to the vocal cords, which lay anterior to the esophagus. As you can see, the ET tube is being placed right in the center of the vocal cords in this picture. In this sagittal view of the upper airway, note how the ET tube curves and enters the trachea and vocal cords anterior to the esophagus. Note how the epiglottis and tongue are largely in the way, which you'll have to manipulate and move in order to visualize the cord appropriately. The last aspect of anatomy we will cover is the Malampati score. Just know there are four classes. Class 1 is the best and allows complete visualization of the soft palate, while class 4 means absolutely no visualization of the soft palate and would likely be a difficult airway. Don't get too worked up on the details of this scoring system, just know it exists, type 1 is best, and type 4 is worst. A good mnemonic to remember when getting ready for intubation is SOAPME, suction, oxygenation, airway equipment, pharmacology, and your monitoring equipment. This is a pretty standard layout of your airway equipment. Using the mnemonic you just learned, let's start with our suction. What you see is a standard issued yank hour suction tip. It's a good idea to have the suction plugged into the wall, turned on, and ready to go before you even start intubating. It's also a good idea to have a second suction tip at hand in case your first suction fails. Oxygenation. A critical step in intubation is to pre-oxygenate your patient, as we will demonstrate shortly. This allows your patient to maximize their oxygen saturation before you attempt to secure their airway. This is a bag valve mask. In addition to this, you should place the nasal cannula on the patient and have oxygen cranked to its maximum at 15 liters per minute. Using a nasal cannula in addition to a mask will allow you to maximize the pre-oxygenation step. Airway. What you see are two endotracheal tubes with stylet placed, in addition to a rescue airway on the left. Endotracheal tubes come in various sizes. The most commonly used size is 7.5. You can use a 7.0 endotracheal tube for smaller adults and an 8.0 endotracheal tube for larger adults. The rescue airway that you see on the left is called the laryngeal mask airway and can be placed when the endotracheal tubes fail. Other rescue airways can include a surgical cricoid kit or video laryngoscopy. It is important to always have a rescue airway when preparing to intubate a patient. In addition to your endotracheal tubes and your rescue airway, you must have your laryngoscope ready. 
The Ranger scopes come in two varieties, the Macintosh blade and the Miller blade. The Mac is the curved blade, and the Miller is a straight blade. If you get confused, just remember, Miller has two L's in its name, which are straight letters, while Macintosh has a C in its name, which is a curved letter. The Macintosh blade is used to manipulate the follicula, which subsequently mobilizes the epiglottis and allows visualization of the vocal cords. The Miller blade is used to directly manipulate and lift the epiglottis out of the way so that you can access the vocal cords. The Macintosh blade is the most commonly used laryngoscope blade. When preparing your laryngoscope blades, make sure your handle and blade are connected and that your laryngoscope light source is working. Macintosh blades come in a variety of sizes. The most common is a size 3. Size 0 is for infants and size 4 is for larger adults. For most adult patients, a Macintosh 3 blade will likely allow you to adequately visualize the vocal cords. The P in Soap Me stands for Pharmacology, and we have already covered sedatives and paralytics in great detail. Finally, monitoring equipment. This is relatively self-explanatory and includes a cardiac monitor, pulse ox, and blood pressure cuff so you can assess the real-time hemodynamics of your patient while preparing, pre-oxygenating, and intubating your patient. One piece of monitoring equipment to remember is the end tidal CO2 which will confirm successful intubation. What you see here is a color change device which is a pH sensitive chemical indicator that changes color from purple to yellow when exposed to CO2. This device connects to the endotracheal tube and will allow confirmation of the ET tube in the airway. The first thing you need to do is make sure that you're familiar with the resuscitation bed uh, prior to ever seeing a patient. There's going to be a lot of people walking around, talking over the top of each other, doing a lot of different things. You can't be orienting yourself to your environment at the same time you're trying to, to critically think through the clinical skill you're about to perform on this gentleman to save his life. Uh, so you need to know where everything is. First off, he's got lead placements for EKGs. He's got, he's on his monitor. Uh, he has oxygen normally would be running either through a nasal cannula or a non-rebreather mask. Uh, or possibly being uh, not invasively ventilated through a back valve mask. Uh, he has fluids hanging on his IV. So those are things you need. You need to know all of this long before you ever start to perform any sort of uh, uh, exam or skill on a patient. You need to know all of this is running. Uh, so to examine this gentleman, the first thing you need to do is do your ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. The easiest way to uh, assess for airway is just asking his name what's going on. Sir, sir, can you tell me your name? Okay, he's not talking to me. That, that lets me know that his airway could be compromised. Next thing is his breathing. We assess that with a stethoscope, see how his lungs sound. Uh, then the, after that would be circulation. Circulation will... Uh, go to the monitor form. Uh, we'll show you that here in a second. Right now his vitals aren't very good. His blood pressure is pretty low. He's, uh, his heart rate is raised, called tachycardia. And uh, significantly for this skill, his oxygen saturations are extremely low. Uh, that's more than enough for me to, be, to say this gentleman needs to have his airway taken. This is an example of an ideal setup when intubating a patient. The practitioner is using gloves, gown, and a face shield to ensure that he's adequately protected. Note that each bag of the bag valve mask occurs about once every 6 seconds, which is the normal physiological respiratory rate. Note the practitioner's single hand C grip, in which he uses his thumb and index finger to grab the mask and his third, fourth, and fifth digits to grab the inferior part of the mandible. While not clearly demonstrated in this video, Practitioner is using nasal cannula in addition to his bag valve mask to ensure adequate pre-oxygenation of his patient. He has all his necessary equipment within arm's reach and even has an assistant who will now help pre-oxygenate the patient. Note how the provider uses a rolled up towel to place the head in the sniffing position, which helps to minimize airway resistance and get a better look at the vocal cords. The provider then checks his laryngoscope blades to make sure the light source is working adequately. Note that he has not just one, but a backup blade as well. He then checks both of his endotracheal tubes and inflates the cuff of both tubes to ensure that his equipment is functioning properly.
Once the provider has adequately pre-oxygenated the patient, he uses his right hand to pry open the mouth and insert the Liringer scope smoothly using his left hand without hitting the patient's teeth. He then visualizes the vocal cords, keeping his eyes on the vocal cords, grabs the ET tube, and smoothly inserts it into the vocal cords. For most adult patients, the ET tube should be placed at a depth of 21 to 24 centimeters, which are marked on the ET tube itself. Once the provider is satisfied with the ET tube placement, the stylet is then removed and the color metric end tidal CO2 device is attached. The bag valve mask attaches to the end tidal CO2 and a couple breaths are given to confirm placement in the respiratory tract. The provider then takes his stethoscope and auscultates over the stomach to ensure no breath sounds are heard there. He then places the stethoscope over both lungs to ensure that he hears bilateral breath sounds. We want to make sure that we have a tube in the trachea with the cuff inflated. That's the definition of a secure airway. As you prepare, you want to make sure all your equipment is ready to go. Laryngoscope is powered, bulb is working. In the tracheal tube with a stylet in place, the tip of the stylet, of course, recessed from the end of the tube. Inflate your cuff to make sure that it's working. Suction is available as well. With the head slightly tilted, making sure that suction is applied so all the secretions are out of the way. The laryngoscope blade is introduced, the tongue is swept to the right, and the elevation on the laryngoscope blade goes up and away from the patient, not cranking on the teeth. Visualizing the cords, I place the tube and watch the cuff go inside the cords. Stylet comes out, cuff is inflated, and patient is ventilated. Watch for rise and fall of the chest, and then auscultate to hear breath sounds on each side with no borborygmy. An additional device is the end tidal CO2 monitor. Once the patient has been intubated successfully, this device allows you to double check and make sure that you're in the trachea. By placing this device between the endotracheal tube and your bag, you're able to watch for a color change that occurs that witnesses the CO2 level rising with your resuscitation. Normally the color is purple when it comes out of the bag showing low CO2 concentrations and you expect to see this change from purple to tan to yellow letting you know that you have successful intubation. 